Hello and welcome to a new edition of Planet Waves TV. My name is Eric Francis Coppolino, the editor of planetwaves.net and the host of planetwaves.fm on the Pacifica Radio Network. All my work's available at planetwaves.net. Welcome. Good to be with you. It's been a little longer than planned, but I am back with an update um, which is uh, going to focus on the sun's ingress into Sagittarius and what happens in this last month before uh, Jupiter and Saturn enter Aquarius and form a conjunction, their once-per-20-year conjunction in the first degree of Aquarius. And then I'll, uh, at the end, have a little science homework report, uh, which today is going to be a little bit of a psychology science homework report, uh, because we, uh, we seem to be in this um, moment where essentially psychology has taken over science and we are uh, being led around by a whole bunch of fear. Who knows, maybe we can spot that in the chart. Uh, the thing about fear is that uh, it usually accompanies uncertainty. And if there is uh, added uncertainty, that is going to make people susceptible to fear. And there would be plenty of, uh, of, of uncertainty. I was going to say plenty of absurdity. Plenty of uncertainty without this whole COVID thing, which is basically just essentially sweeping all of our other problems that have not been addressed or resolved in any kind of a responsible fashion into one bin and then kind of shooting them at us and saying, ah, now this is your one and only problem uh, and, uh, and, and there's no solution <laughs> to the one and only problem. That's, that's problematic. All right. Uh, so let's just take a quick look at the chart for as of when the sun enters uh, Sagittarius on, on the 21st. That's 19 today's what day? I'm, 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 I'm day date compromised. I have, uh, okay, that would be on Saturday. The sun enters uh, Sagittarius at uh, 3.39.39 p.m. Oops, this is not a very good view. I'm looking at a calendar. Eastern Standard Time. Again, uh, 3.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We see the sun in Sagittarius there. I know it's not so uh, ceremonious. We'll just, we'll just put a zero, zero, Sag, zero, zero there. And that takes place on, on Saturday afternoon. Um, so uh, between sun, sun changing signs is um, a relevant thing to follow in astrology. If you're new to astrology, uh, the things to follow, hopefully that truck does not leave its thing running the whole duration of this uh, broadcast. Let me put, I'm going to speak a little bit closer to the microphone uh, just in case it does. Um, so <clears throat> If you're new to astrology, following the sun and the moon changing signs is a helpful thing to do, and you will start to get the feeling and the rhythm of astrology by following the sun and the moon, and in particular, solar and lunar aspects. This truck is uh, irritating me. I wonder if I, I have the, the mental uh, self-presence to ignore an enormous truck running its engine outside of my window. Let's see. Hope that is not too annoying for you. All right. It's a little annoying for me. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to have some news about that. Uh, in particular, the, uh, the, the new moon and the full moon when the sun is in uh, Sagittarius are both eclipses. Uh, so that is uh, going to act as an accelerant. Uh, there is a, the next thing coming up is a full moon on 1130th, 11.30, the last day of November, and that is a, uh, a penumbral lunar eclipse. The eclipse looks like a little barbell, lunar eclipse looks like a little barbell like that, see that? And that's going to be followed two weeks later uh, on December 14th by a total solar eclipse in Sagittarius, total solar eclipse, 23 and change degrees on the 14th. So uh, that's convenient to remember. Uh, there's a full moon on the 30th. That's an eclipse, a penumbral eclipse. There have been three previous penumbral lunar eclipses this year. And then 
uh, there will be a total eclipse of the sun. If I'm recalling correctly, we haven't seen too many total eclipses of the sun um, anytime uh, lately, but I, I, I have, I've closed that window. By the way, my source on uh, things like eclipses and transits is a fantastic website called serenu.com, S-E-R-E-N-N-U, one person, uh, wrote and programmed and developed the site over many years, and it is a work of astrological art. Uh, I, I am um, st I strongly favor using books as sources of information, um, but with websites like Serenu S E R E N N U dot com, uh, you have a lot of help and a lot of resources uh, that you might not ordinarily have, including a thing that lists logs, eclipses, and occultations of planets, little mini eclipses when the moon makes an exact conjunction uh, to a planet. So that's where I got this information from. And so once again, uh, penumbral lunar eclipse on the 30th, total solar eclipse on the 14th of December uh, with the sun in the galactic zone. So one of the things that happens when the sun uh, is in Sagittarius is that it makes conjunctions to two deep space points uh, in uh, in Sagittarius, the, the two most important deep space points uh, that you can work with, things that are way, way, way outside of our solar system, are the center of our galaxy. Uh, the center of our galaxy is at about 27 degrees of Sagittarius. The center of our local universe is called the Great Attractor. The Great Attractor is at 14 degrees of Sagittarius. So it just so happens that, that the center of our galaxy, a, a, a collection of somewhere around 30 billion stars and a beautiful spiral, uh, is, is located at the end of Sagittarius. And, and then uh, a, 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 the, the focal point of a very large collection of galaxies is at 15 Sagittarius, 14 degrees and change, 15, a little bit over 14, so in the 15th degree. And so if you're wondering what it is about Sagittarians that makes, makes them so unworldly and so difficult to comprehend sometimes and, uh, and, and so strangely energetic and, and just seeming like they're a little bit uh, from, uh, from a different planet, that is because there is so much in, uh, in Sagittarius that uh, is from far beyond uh, our world from far beyond any any local concept of, uh, of of like you know just bugs crawling around on earth and pumping water out of the well uh, that that's what you get in Sagittarius and uh, so there is an acceleration uh, associated with that there's also an acceleration up here in the northern hemisphere because the days uh, keep compressing and, and getting shorter and shorter as we approach the southern solstice, otherwise called the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, uh, also called the Capricorn solstice. Uh, and that's on uh, the 21st of, of December. And this is a major uh, convergence point uh, this year because Jupiter and Saturn align in their once per 20 year alignment in the first degree of Aquarius on the same day that the sun reaches solstice point. So let's let's just take a look at how that looked. Now this all sounds very fancy. I, I get that. It's a lot of a lot of um, technical mumbo jumbo that I, I normally leave out. But at a certain point, uh, you you, uh, you you enjoy astrology more if you start learning some of these things. And I admit it takes a while to learn. There's a long warm up, uh, but we have a lot of resources, free resources, I would add on Planet Waves that will teach you astrology. And if when you're reading one of my articles, you follow along with my references to the chart, which I intentionally keep easy, I, I do not go into depth. I, I point out the most salient things going on uh, in my in my twice weekly columns, uh, you will start to follow along. And if you follow the sun and the moon and the lunar cycles and the eclipses for a year, you will have a clue uh, what what is going on. And the upshot is that uh, from the time that the sun enters Sagittarius on Saturday, we have one month before the Jupiter-Saturn alignment in Aquarius. This is the last major event of, of 2020. It is the beginning of the Aquarian era that goes through 2044. 
so one of the things I'm doing this year's annual edition on, a, a special project called An Aquarian Era, is a, a look ahead at the astrology uh, as it's going to manifest between uh, essentially December 21st going all the way out uh, to, uh, to 2044. So my intent with that project, again called An Aquarian Era, is to <coughs> excuse me, is to uh, synchronize you with all of this movement in Aquarius. We have not had a lot of activity in Aquarius. Uh, that that has pretty much ended as of around 2012, uh, when uh, when when Neptune entered Pisces. And so for the past eight years, uh, there has been no activity, ma outer planet activity, in Aquarius, uh, and, uh, and and Neptune. In, in Aquarius, <coughs> oh, again, excuse me, Neptune in Aquarius, again, is not um, easy to discern. It's not, uh, it's not one of those things you can really work with. Uh, and it was, it was kind of a thing that uh, a lot of people felt they had to endure. It was, uh, and for some, it felt like a, a kind of a never-ending transit that just sort of went on and on and on. Neptune is a very slow-moving planet. Um, it moves only slightly faster uh, than Pluto, and for for much of Pluto's orbit, Pluto moves more quickly than Neptune. That now, uh, as of the 1990s, is uh, is is over. So uh, the 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 events are uh, next major thing up is the uh, penumbral lunar eclipse on the 30th, followed by uh, the solar eclipse. Uh, on on the 14th and then right after the solar eclipse Jupiter and Saturn change signs right in that very week and then on the 21st the sun enters Capricorn and then there's the conjunction of uh, of, of Jupiter and Saturn uh, there is no way to overestimate what uh, what big astrology this is uh, on uh, on on a scale uh, of a century right this is not the kind of thing uh, that it's like, oh, this is exciting now. This is a, you know, this is um, this is the thing to talk about today. Th this is the thing that I've been writing about for approximately three years uh, since l late late 2018, leading into this moment, and it and it is uh, also the thing that is reflective of all of this new world order shit that is going on, where uh, whether you believe in the new world order and whether you believe the IMF is doing anything. And whether you believe uh, that the Illuminati are behind everyone, whatever the hell that means, the the world is being ordered in a new way, and we are being shown the results of much previous ordering of the world that has gone on during the past twenty years that has not been made plain that we have not seen uh, direct evidence of until now. We have not seen uh, direct evidence of the power of pan-governmental organizations like the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the United Nations until now. And suddenly, uh, in the midst of a crisis, of course, in the midst of a crisis, uh, we are seeing the power of these, uh, th these organizations. And so it is things that are larger than governments. Uh, th this is a problem because things that are larger than governments are claiming to have jurisdiction over our lives. I mean, it's a little like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where something, some authority bigger than the Earth decides they're just going to put a bypass right through where, you know, a, a turnaround, you know, for the freeway, right, right through where our planet is. Oops, they're going to have to just destroy the Earth, right? That's the opening premise of the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, to the Galaxy. That is similar to what is going on. So uh, astrologically, where we're at in, in these approximately uh, five weeks until uh, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, until the solstice, uh, during which time we have two eclipses, which are, are, are going to, uh, um, two eclipses involving the sign Sagittarius, mind you, uh, w are, are going to give this sense of acceleration, uh, this sense of movement, uh, and, and this sense of, of being out, out of control in a sense. You know, I'm, I'm often asked whether I think that these um, world management team type of people use astrologers. Uh, 
I don't think that they do, actually. Uh, they, they may, right? We, I have no way to prove or, or to, to disprove uh, this. Uh, it is possible that at this time they have, uh, they have checked in with some astrology. God knows who's listening to, 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 to my uh, you know, broadcasts and reading my articles. I've, I've appeared essentially in every major national newspaper and numerous magazines over time. So I know from that that anybody can be watching my work. Uh, and, and so this is, you know, when, when I you know, get a letter from that person, you know, thanking me for my blog post, and I'm like bug-eyed looking at the email thinking, how is this even possible? So they may not be consulting astrologers, but the, everybody's watching YouTube videos. Every, every stuff is popping up on everybody's feed. So it is possible that they are aware of the astrology, but is that leading them to make these maneuvers now? I kind of don't think so. I, I do think that people are sensitive to the incoming and conditioning energies, though. And I think that people are uh, responding intuitively and emotionally, empathically, uh, and, and we're also having a resonance effect uh, from all of us. And uh, this, is, um, th th this is part of what is moving things. I mean, the, the astrology of, of 2020 is... Uh, without question, the the biggest astrology probably going back, I would say to uh, to the 1960s. That was that was pretty big. 1960s was a a combination of uh, Chiron, Saturn, Uranus, and Pluto all making a a, a pattern uh, with Neptune in the picture. So you had all the outer planets mixed up into one uh, major aspect pattern that that moved everything along. Um, and we have seen nothing like that since then, talking approximately 1965, uh, 1966. So we're, we're among the biggest years of astrology uh, in, in the uh, 20th century. And so um, the, the uh, you know, it's like it said that a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, uh, the, the astrology as it's happening moves everyone, whether or not they have contact and communication with astrologers. And so th that's what's happening. And there's, uh, there's a synchronicity effect happening and a lot of things are happening. The difference between knowing about the astrology and not knowing about the astrology is, is the difference between having uh, a dashboard lit up in your car, driving at night, having headlights and having a clean wind, wind, uh, windscreen in front of the car uh, ver versus not having these, um, these uh, additional navigational tools. Uh, I, I am a person who would prefer to drive with a compass than I would with GPS, right? I have, uh, I, you know, after I got my new car a couple of years ago, I <clears throat> changed out my rear view mirror and got one of those rear view mirrors that tells me my approximate compass heading. Th this is very helpful. And, uh, it, and I, I think it's more important to be able to navigate by a compass heading than by uh, GPS. And my astrology presented to you is uh, presented in a similar fashion. I'm not here to uh, help you micromanage. I'm here to tell you the larger trends and then uh, give you some pointers about how you work from the, uh, from the general to the specific, which I think is the appropriate uh, direction to work in astrology, to understand the big things and then apply them to the small things. And one of the one, so summing that up, uh, what we have happening right now is a lot of very, very, very large movement. Everyone can feel it. My dogs get agitated when there's large astrology happening. Mars stationing, uh, Mars stationing direct. My friend Henrietta was like, I had agita, and 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 uh, this is uh, uh, like Mars stationing. She was fine after it, it it passed by. So living things can all feel this stuff. And, uh, and, and here we are. And so this is partly why this movement of the planets right now with this grouping that has defined 2020 here in Capricorn, Pluto, Pallas Athene, Jupiter, and Saturn, still currently all in Capricorn, this is all about to change. As Jupiter and Saturn enter Aquarius and then Pallas enters Aquarius and a whole new era begins. Now, the, it, it, not everyone is um, interested in a whole new era beginning. Not everyone knows how to take advantage of this. Um, the, the events of this year have taken a tremendous cost on all of us in terms of our time, 
our money, our energy. Yeah, there's a few people having a great time and making uh, making a lot of money, but uh, m- most people are not. And even if your finances are okay or uh, or good, uh, then you you are still experiencing this incredible time drain and energy drain of uh, of having to deal with this. And there's a lot of people in uh, in in tremendous anxiety right now. So I'm going to get to in a moment. So bear in mind uh, that over the next approximately four to five weeks, a lot of stuff just changes very rapidly, beginning with the sun um, entering Sag, then an eclipse, then another eclipse, then Jupiter and Pluto enter Aquarius, then the sun enters Capricorn, and then there's a conjunction of Jupiter and Pluto on the solstice. Um, it, It will help if you understand... The nature of fear, and uh, and here here's here's my science report. Um, one of the things that we've got going on right now is that uh, all of the major media, none of which are independent anymore, there there is no major media outlet that is not now in synchronization with uh, the larger agenda that is being played out right now. Um, we, we can we can debate whether there's a larger agenda, but that is easily uh, demonstrable by a wide variety of reports that have been published by organizations uh, like the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, the, the concept of uh, the, the Great Reset, which has been talked about for, for the last 20 years and is now well underway. Uh, and th- th- the problem here is that this agenda is not about ordinary people and and what it is also doing is creating a tr- tremendous uh, fear in much of the population that is being stoked by these media outlets that are not independent they are not independent I'm sorry to say this but not only are places beholden uh, to their advertisers they seem to be beholden to some other agenda that is in operation and and the best example of that uh, that I that I can give you is that the New York Times has done a series of articles in 2020 talking about problems with the polymerase chain reaction uh, assay this thing that is being used to drive the entire case count. And their own reporting repeatedly says that up to 90% of these uh, of these results are false positives. If you believe that there is such a thing as a positive from the polymerase chain reaction, I no, now no longer uh, use that concept because the polymerase chain reaction is not uh, capable of giving a negative or a positive. Uh, all, all it is not a diagnostic tool. It is not a pregnancy test. It is not a thing that can tell you for certain uh, wh- whether you are pregnant and then confirmable by the presence of a baby, right? Ultimately, pregnancy is confirmed by a baby, but we know these pregnancy tests are pretty accurate. The polymerase chain reaction has nothing to do with with this. It is searching for a single molecule of something, the presence of which does not tell you anything about the person's state of health. Uh, according to the inventor of the polymerase chain reaction, every human body has at least one molecule of everything in it. So if that one molecule comes up, the polymerase chain reaction can then turn it into 35 trillion molecules in 45 minutes. And that's the only thing it's looking for. So this is very, very problematic. The New York Times has done this story four times this year that I have seen. I was surprised uh, the results that I got when I typed the phrase case, uh, sorry, cycle threshold into the time search engine. I suggest that you do that and that you familiarize yourself with this concept. Um, and, and so with most jurisdictions running the cycle threshold of the PCR at 37 to 45 cycles, when even Fauci says the limit is 35 and other responsible people, I don't consider Fauci responsible, are saying that it should be as low as 17, and some saying absolutely not to use this test as a diagnostic tool, all of these people who are being called infected with a case of a virus, which there's no sample of the virus, there's no sample of the virus, this is fucked up. And you say this to people and say, well, there has to be, there has to be a sample of the virus. Look, here's this article claiming that at McMaster University or something they isolated and purified. No, not when you look at what they actually did. They did not. There's no purified isolate of this virus, which is why they are using 
a false primer to look for virus in the population. They're not looking for the thing they're claiming in the population with a sample of that. They made something up and they're looking for whatever that happens to match in, in the wider population. So the New York Times has covered around this area many times this year, but they're not a down they're not downward adjusting their case count. They, the New York Times has said in its coverage that the cycle threshold of any test is needed to understand the meaning of this test. How many times did they run the machine? How many cycles did the machine run to get the quote unquote positive result? Well, uh, that matters. But that matters more than anything matters because you you don't know what you've got until you know the cycle threshold, because the PCR makes the thing it's looking for. And everyone knows this. Everyone knows this, particularly virologists, anyone in research, epidemiology, any journalist who's, who's done the story. They may be misled about what the, the meaning of that is. That's, th th that is one thing, and it is not responsible to be misled about the meaning of this. This is extremely well documented. And the manufacturers of these machines, the FDA and the CDC and their emergency authorizations for these machines all say this is not a diagnostic tool. So the question is, why is every single major media outlet, except for a few freaks on Facebook and a, some bloggers, all saying that these are confirmed cases of an infection. How is that even possible? Well, that is evidence of an agenda. And additionally, people are, uh, journalists who may get this are afraid to backtrack their position. There's a whole thing about saving face here. Uh, and like, well, how long did you know that? Let, let's say, uh, let, let's say so someone is successful at calling out the Times and saying, how long did you really know about this problem with the PCR? Well, 2007. We know the Times has known about this at, at the latest since uh, 2007. That's the first published article uh, on the problem. It, it was published all through the 1990s by Celia Farber in Spin Magazine, who went to war with the virology establishment and the NIH and CDC over this uh, and and uh, demonstrated that this machine is, uh, is not a, a, a diagnostic tool. Everyone knows it's not a diagnostic tool. So the question then is, why is this fear being pumped up, pumped up, pumped up, pumped up? So, for example, the New York City schools closed down again this week based on the number of positive cases. Well, um, maybe if they would do what Fauci said and lower the cycle threshold to 35, we wouldn't have so many. We certainly wouldn't have this many positive cases. You'd lose most of your positive cases so-called positive cases, almost all of your positive cases are created by running the cycle threshold at 40 to 45 cycles when the limit is supposed to be 35. Fauci said this in an interview uh, in, in July, that all you get are dead nucleotides above 35 cycles. And all you get are dead nucleotides long before 35 cycles, but still, why then this manic panic? Why this abuse of this technological data? Why, why isn't anyone in a larger place saying we, we have to stop talking about the PCR as if it existed in its own universe and talk about what the PCR is being used to do, which is to hype 24-7 nonstop fear? And the people doing the 24-7 hyping of nonstop fear have a lot of skin in the game. Whether that skin in the game is investment in vaccines, whether it's ratings, whether it's making sure that they're not called a crazy nutbag by people, whether it is um, some much m more sinister agenda in operation. The, the way society is handling this quote-unquote pandemic is not the way that a health issue should be handled. There are many, many things people can be told to do to prevent the spread of this, assuming it's, it's, it's a, a real virus. And the only reason I am doubting that it is a real virus is because there are no purified isolates of the virus. You, you can't scientifically say something exists until you have it. You can say, well, there must be black swans, but you don't know for sure until you find one. And I, I get this may seem to go over, you know, the heads of, of, of most people. And what doesn't go over the heads of most people is terror. They're afraid. And they're made to be afraid. But I would ask you who are afraid, 
potentially. Since when do we handle a health situation by locking all the healthy people in their house or blocking them from going to school? How, how is that uh, handling a health situation? Partic excuse me, particularly when there are numerous things we can be doing, told to be doing, that would help with whatever it is they say this thing is. Uh, those would include vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and melatonin. This is exactly what President Trump was given when he was in Walter Reed, being treated by captains and colonels. Yes, they gave him other stuff. They gave him remdesivir, whatever, a cocktail. But they also put him on this basic regimen of vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and, and melatonin. All we're getting from authorities is mask up, lock down, stay apart. Mask up, lock down, stay apart, humiliate, rage, humiliate, threaten, threaten, and humiliate. If, if, if someone is unwell, you, you, you treat that person. If, if you, you think someone might be unwell, you find out if that's true. But you don't berate the person. You, you don't humiliate the person. You don't sequester the person. You don't take numerous elderly people who are sick with other things near the end of their life and lock them away from their family. That's how you kill them quickly. And there was a lot of that going on in the spring. A lot of killing people quickly by hospital policy, medical policy, and, and nursing home policy. My concern is prior to this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, if society locks down again, it will never unlock again. You, you may think that this is somehow helpful, but those who have been watching this uh, are, are hip to the fact that these measures are not only not helpful, they are dangerous, they are causing additional illness, they are causing suicides, they, they are causing additional domestic violence, alcoholism, and drug overdoses. So something is only helpful in as much as it helps, and the, the danger must be considered at the same time. Now, uh, solution-oriented, uh, perhaps you noticed, uh, and I'll, I'll do a little more announcing of this, but now's a good opportunity. On Saturday, I attended an event in upstate New York, uh, over Hill and Dale, up the river, across lots of farmland, and in the backwoods, uh, uh, east, east of... Uh, East of someplace, let's just say that. It was a lot of roads and side roads and back roads from here, fairly local, to here. Uh, Dr. Andrew Kaufman and, uh, and Dr. Thomas Cowan both spoke. You who watch YouTube may have seen quite a few of these videos. These are the two medical doctors who have done the most uh, elegant and, and uh, comprehensible and friendly explanation of what, uh, what problem we actually have uh, talking about things like Koch's postulates, Rivers postulates, isolation and purification, uh, the, the concept of a virus or a bacteria being a vector. Uh, and I spent the day with uh, both of those guys and a big bunch of other people, uh, all, all packed into one big kind of enormous multi-purpose room, not a single mask in sight, everyone hanging out, socializing, hugging, shaking hands, and eating food from the same platters. Just digging in, eating it like a normal potluck dinner. The entire day's uh, presentation is available at planetwaves.fm. You actually have to go to planetwaves.net. Sorry, it's not on the FM site yet. Go to planetwaves.net and select the Planet Waves FM tab. Or you can go to planetwaves.net and select the COVID-19 news tab. We update many times a day. We're well over 1,000 updates for 2020. Uh, we started on March 1st, so that's like 1,000 updates in basically nine months. That's pretty impressive. A couple of uh, talented young editors uh, named Anna and Spencer are currently doing most of the work on that blog. It is it is free, though we are sponsored by your donations and, and, uh, and memberships. If you like the work that we're doing here at Planet Waves, please make a donation to Chiron Return or get yourself a core community membership. If you cannot afford to, just spread the word, stay in touch, and there's lots of um, lots that you can be doing. I have a big tent, and I welcome people, and I do a lot of teaching. 
uh, as well. So this is the time for citizen journalists to get in uh, on the act and learn how to do what you do. All right. For those listening on Facebook, apologies for one channel out. That's a bug that we don't understand yet. Um, we'll have this up on YouTube anytime. Thank you, Kate in the Ukraine for editing this video. Thank you to the entire Planet Waves team for helping me keep it all together. I am the future of science. So I subscribe to Science Magazine and got a t-shirt. So I guess I'm claiming uh, being the future of science. Love you all. Stay in touch. Planetwaves.net. Like, subscribe, love, and bye for now. Thank mm -hmm. you.